Hello and welcome to episode one of the Lister webinar, COVID-19. Uh, today we are introducing a slightly longer edition, um, looking at a clinical overview. So I'm Joe Newman. I'm TJ, we're both chest registrars at Lister Hospital. And we both have an interest in medical education and are really keen to share the latest updates with you. So today, um, we are basing this largely on our own clinical experience. That plus we've collected data from every single COVID patient that we've had so far in the trust. Um, which is about 140-ish patients at the moment. Um, and we're combining our own experience with the local pathways and protocols that have been developed and national guidelines from BTS, from the Royal Colleges, uh, NHS England, etc. So this presentation has been approved and very kindly updated by uh, Suresh, the medical director, and Dr. Locke. Uh, clinical director for respiratory medicine so that it is up to date as possible. Having said that, this is on the 3rd of April 2020 and things are changing rapidly. Um, so if there are updates then we will let you know about these down the line. A few other points to mention that we are trying to keep this as clinical as possible without managing our COVID patients. We don't want to get bogged down with things like rotary issues at the moment. This is about clinical management of our patients. Um, we hope has a fairly broad scope. We're aiming this mainly at people who are coming into uh, managing COVID patients for the first time. So that may be our specialty uh, surgical colleagues who are now helping out with medicine. Uh, hopefully it's relevant for also uh, nurses or consultants. Um, and across the board, we hope that there's something here for everyone. Um, this is obviously a COVID talk and this is going to be mainly about that. But I think it's really important to think that when patients come in, it's not a case that they have COVID or not, they have COVID or something else. And we still need to be doing good general medicine for those patients who uh, don't have COVID or have COVID and comorbidities and thinking a bit more holistically. Um, we'd also like to invite you to jot down any questions that you have as we go along about things that we don't have time to touch upon or things that we mentioned but need further clarification. Um, so, at the end, we'll give you an email address that you can email those questions to. We'll go away, speak to the right people, and come back and update you down the line. We have ideas for future episodes to go into things in a little bit more depth that we touch upon today. Um, areas such as Optiflow, CPAP, um, palliative care, PPE. Um, so those are all things that we can expand upon. But we'd like your thoughts. So we'll just start off on a... Uh, really simple note because obviously some of you whilst we've been watching the news and we've been reading uh, all the things that have been coming through about this uh, about this virus there are lots of facts and things that people may have missed or well basically just some some basic things that we should all we should all be aware of so very briefly we know that so, so far research has shown that this virus uh, has an incubation period between two to 14 days on average it can take four or five days of symptoms to manifest over the last few weeks, we've seen that Public Health England and the, the government have changed the way that we've, uh, we now isolate. So the current rules are that if you yourself are symptomatic with a persistent new cough or fever, uh, then you need to be self-isolating for seven days. If you live with any family members or there's anyone within your, your house or you're sharing your, your sharing your accommodation with, uh, then they need to be self-isolating for 14 days because they may soon develop symptoms within that time period. Lots of information had come from um, all these studies in the last few months to say that how, how this disease may progress. Initially, they had said that fever, uh, shorts of breath were all sort of part of the timeline of the disease. What we've seen, particularly from our own cohort, cohort of patients, or in fact across the UK, is that there is no obvious timeline to some of these patients. They are all presenting with a variety of symptoms, which Joe's going to explain to you soon. But it's just to be aware of that. Briefly, this diagram shows you the reasons why we are um, uh, protecting ourselves the way they are. This is called a fomite to face um, uh, transmission, essentially. So we know that COVID uh, is a, a droplet infection. But of course, the main thing is that any kind of virus uh, can live on surfaces for quite, quite some time. It can, be, it can be from some hours to even days, actually. So if a patient becomes unwell, sneezes, coughs or on their phone, their laptop, uh, any surfaces that they're using, well, they will, the virus will form a thin layer uh, on top of those surfaces and it can last for, for, that amount, uh, for a significant amount of time. When uh, the next person then uses that, 
that equipment or, or touches that surface, well, that virus can be transmitted onto their hands. And of course, then it's quite, um, uh, quite a thing that we always touch our nose, our eyes, our faces all the time. Um, and then that's how we become well and round and round the cycle it goes. So that's why it's really important that we are washing our hands regularly. We're using alcohol gel provided in the hospital. We, we're constantly washing our hands every time we enter the ward and exit the ward using soap and hot water. That will minimize the risk of transmission through this way. Okay, so the main focus uh, for this first episode of the webinar is that we want to look at how we assess our patients clinically. Um, so we'll look at the clinical features in a moment. Um, we'll look through some common abnormalities with blood tests. Um, TJ will run through some imaging. Um, we'll talk about our RAG risk stratification score, um, who and how to swab, um, and some other bits and pieces. So the clinical features, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, regardless of what um, clinical backgrounds you come from, the three main things are fever, breathlessness, and a non-productive cough. For me, as a chest trainee, the thing I worry about most is breathlessness with these patients. Those who have progressive breathless, breathlessness correspond with an increasing oxygen demand um, and tend to be more sick. On top of that, though, we know that there's also a whole load of other slightly more non-specific flu-like symptoms, such as myalgia, malaise, um, fatigue. One of our GPST colleagues who's been working with respiratory, Zana, has done some really interesting work with the data that we've collected to show that a lot of patients um, have anosmia, which is a complete loss of smell. There's also GI symptoms, so abdominal pain, diarrhea, less commonly, but something to think about. And then there are also patients who come in with no symptoms. They may present for something completely unrelated, possibly a non-medical problem. Um, and they are picked up uh, typically through uh, chest x-ray or CT scan um, and they need to be managed in the same way um, as patients who are symptomatic um, and go on to be swabbed etc. Uh, clinical signs, the main thing really uh, from an examination point of view is that patients uh, may or may not have a crackly chest. Um, just be cautious in those with already underlying lung disease such as fibrosis or bronchiectasis or uh, those with heart failure. And then in terms of observations, we look most importantly at the oxygen saturation. Are these patients um, hypoxic? Are they tachyneic? Um, and do they have a temperature? Um, and then the next step in the workup would be looking at their blood tests. So it's really well established now that the majority of patients who go on to test positive for coronavirus uh, have a lymphopenia on their full blood count. So that means by definition that the lymphocyte count is less than one. Um, it's very unusual for a patient with coronavirus to have a normal CRP of less than five. We typically see a bit of a mild rise, 30, 40, 50, um, but also patients can have CRPs in the hundreds. And that may suggest that A, they're probably very unwell and B, there's possibly a super added bacterial infection on top of that. Um, some studies have suggested that a neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio of three to one um, correlates with the worst prognosis down the line. And then there's a lot of other slightly non-specific abnormalities that we can pick up in the biochemistry. So patients may um, have an AKI, which is likely to be pre-renal from dehydration, deranged LFTs with a hepatitic picture, so a rise in the ALT. Um, and then, again, studies have shown that um, LDH, D-dimer, ferritin can all be elevated. So let's go through some of the radiology that we've now seen from some of our patients. Um, this is, um, uh, these images and, and these, these protocols have actually been designed by um, Dr. Naveen Sharma and Dr. Will Topping, uh, who uh, we greatly appreciate uh, their help and, and allowing us to share these resources with you. Um, but essentially, at this trust, we have now developed ways to, to report these at chest x-rays to allow us as clinicians to be able to determine whether these patients are at high risk of having COVID uh, or actually we can exclude them and we can manage them in a, in a different way. So at the top here, you can see that one column is labeled COVID, COV2, then COV3 and COV4. So COV1 is essentially a normal chest x-ray, which is why we haven't included it here. COV2 is a abnormal chest x-ray, but actually doesn't have any features that 
we know are related to COVID. So a pneumothorax, a, a pleural effusion, nodules. So these are kinds of things that we still might see on chest x-rays with, with patients coming in through, through the front door, uh, but they, doesn't, they don't necessarily correlate with any uh, particular patterns that we've seen with COVID. COV3 stands for indeterminate. So essentially we might see some patients who are coming in with breathlessness, a productive cough, um, uh, fevers, all sort of uh, fitting with a chest infection. And you might see, for example, a, a unilateral consolidation. Well, we, whilst we might think that COVID might be part of this, actually for me, we would sort of say that this, this could just be a, a barn door community acquired pneumonia. Um, and we should continue to treat that as a community acquired pneumonia. But we will label this, or the radiologist will label this as indeterminate, just so that we can use other features such as the biochemistry and their clinical symptoms to determine whether COVID could be something as part of their differential diagnosis. COV4 will stand for, it stands for probable COVID. Uh, and I'm gonna come on to show you some of the pictures of what these typical or classic uh, X-ray pictures of COVID look like. I've just put up here this link that Dr. Topping and Naveen Sharma um, have, um, have uh, sent out through the Postgrad Centre. So they did a really excellent um, webinar on radiology teaching, some of the images that they've, they've allowed us to use today. Um, uh, and they've done a, a really great webinar just showing you what the kinds of changes that they've seen in COVID and what we've seen. Um, and so I really encourage you when you have a moment to, to go onto this website, that you'll see the, the webinar link at the bottom, which will take you to the video. Uh, really, really uh, interesting uh, stuff to see. So again, this is part of the case series that uh, Dr. Topping and Naveen Sharma provided for us. And these are all cases that we've seen at our trust. So you can see in this picture um, that we have this quite typical presentation of bilateral peripheral midstone consolidation um, uh, around the left and right side here. Um, so this is a kind of chest x-ray that we are seeing quite frequently actually in the daytime for certain patients, patients that we do think have COVID. And so we would label this as a probable COVID picture and lo and behold, the swab for this patient was positive. So all in all, these chest X-ray images help us determine who's at high risk and who definitely has COVID and how we can manage them going forward. This particular example um, uh, was quite good in the sense that um, whilst it doesn't look like a typical chest x-ray for COVID, you can see this right-sided mid-zone opacity, which you could be, uh, uh, you could treat as just a, a, a middle zone pneumonia. Uh, and indeed this patient was treated as such, but because of the way it's not a classical picture, we labeled this as an indeterminate and we had to use our clinical pictures from the biochemistry and the clinical symptoms just to determine whether this patient was at higher risk. 40 hours later, this patient actually did deteriorate and was, went from needing a couple of liters of oxygen to 15 liters and have a look at the chest x-ray now, you can see the, the quite uh, expansive, uh, the way that the chest x-ray has evolved from just that little, that little part in the right middle zone to, to what it looks like now. Uh, it's almost quite a devastating picture and, you can, and it, it fits with the fact that the patient was on 50 meters at that time. So they describe this as a reverse bat wing or, um, or bat wing appearance and, and you can see again, there's these mid zone opacities and the consolidation. So whilst that initial chest x-ray was indeterminate, using clinical suspicion that patient was labelled as higher risk and lo and behold this is the picture we get 40 hours later. CT has been shown to be a much more diagnostic um, uh, step in terms of trying to, trying to understand who does have COVID compared to nasopharyngeal swabs which is what we're doing at the moment. So certain hospitals within the UK and, and, and studies across China have showed us that CT compared to nasopharyngeal, CT is much better at diagnosing it, mainly because we see these peripheral ground glass changes uh, on each side bilaterally. And that can really help us determine whether these are early stages of COVID or whether the patient's recovering or indeed they just have the virus. So helpfully, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Topping have developed this protocol to help us as clinicians again decide um, how we manage these patients going on if they're, if they're admitted into trust. So you can see that if they are a non-COVID or a COV2 chest X-ray with, a, with a, for example, a pneumothorax, we just simply consider them an alternative diagnosis. We don't really consider them to be part of COVID. A normal or indeterminate chest X-ray, so we, again, we have to marry up the clinical suspicion of the, the blood tests and the clinical symptoms, and then use a swab result. Now, if the swab result comes back negative, we, have a, we had a low risk that this patient didn't really have COVID because their, their chest x-ray wasn't that classic, then we will manage them. We, we might say that actually we don't think this, this is COVID. We can manage the patient without having to isolate them or protect ourselves. We can then just uh, either consider repeat imaging or repeat a swab if we think so. So this goes down to the, the low risk. We will come onto the scoring system in a, in a bit. 
Um, if, for example, they have a normal chest X-ray, the swab is negative, but we consider these patients to be at higher risk, we really think they've got it. What the protocol here states is that if we really think they have it um, and we can't wait for the swab result, we'll get a repeat chest X-ray just to see if there's any evolving changes like I showed you in that case before. Um, and we can do that as well as repeat the PCR and then determine where we're going with this patient. If you've got a chest X-ray that is probable COVID, so COV-4, um, the radiologist will actually advise to maybe we should isolate this patient and correlate with the PCR result. If they are negative, the best way to sort of go forward is actually we should repeat the swab test um, because it, on the second attempt, we've seen many cases already that they, they're negative on their first one, but we're so we're so po we're so sure and confident that they've got COVID that we repeat the swab, they come back uh, positive on the second swab. Essentially, all this protocol does is, is, is illustrate to you all that chest X-ray is the way forward and it should be the main, first and main modality of imaging that we should use. You may have heard other hospitals using CTs at the front door, which understandably, yes, they've got a better sensitivity of diagnosing COVID, but on a more practical level, we don't think it's the most appropriate thing to do. Um, and this is part of um, the same protocol. So while we think that CTs are very uh, a useful tool, for now, we are using chest X-rays as the main and uh, priority modality to, to image these patients. So just a quick note on um, which patients are at risk. So we know that the elderly population are a much greater risk of contracting the virus in the first place and then go on to develop a much more severe disease course, um, which unfortunately means they have a higher mortality rate within this group. Um, those with underlying health problems, again, are at greater risk. Um, particularly those with underlying heart, lung, kidney, liver disease, um, and our oncology patients. Any patient who is immunosuppressed, um, so again, patients on chemotherapy, um, high dose long term steroids, or other immunosuppressants are classified as high risk. Smokers, whether they have underlying um, smoking related lung disease or not, are also high risk. So hopefully most of you have seen this by now, um, uh, this poster sort of in all the wars or in ED, but this is how we are risk stratifying our patients coming through the front door. Um, and it's called the RAG score. We developed this over the last few weeks, purely based upon what we're seeing coming through and to be able to help us where to put these patients and how to treat them going forward. So RAG stands for red, amber, green, and I'll break down exactly what, what each um, uh, risk means. So essentially, if you think that you have, when you're reviewing a patient, if you think that they don't fit the case definition in terms of uh, cough, fever, breathlessness, um, they don't have any radiological features or biochemistry features, if for basically you don't think the patient's got COVID, you label them as green and they will go off to a different area where we don't have to isolate and don't have to worry about them. They shouldn't, if they're being admitted, then they shouldn't be swabbed because we don't think they're COVID, there's no point in swabbing them. If though you have a patient that okay, might have mild symptoms or have, may have some biochemistry changes, may have even some, some very atypical, but maybe some, some mild changes on chest x-ray, but you're not really sure, then you would label them as amber. So they were suspected COVID. And these, if you're admitting these patients, again, you'd swap them uh, and you'd label it in your clerk and say that we think this is an amber patient. We think it's suspected, but they're, they're, we're, not, we're not really sure. Uh, and then we can, again, manage them from there as, as a low risk patient. So the reds are the ones that are, we need to keep an eye on. So these are the patients that come in with really severe symptoms, as Joe mentioned. So uh, breathlessness or worsening breathlessness is, is quite a key, key uh, uh, feature that we look out for. Persistent fever, cough. If they've come in with respiratory failure, needing high flow, then straight away, for me, that would think that that is a high risk patient, uh, particularly if they've given a story that 48 hours ago, they were absolutely fine and they, and they come in needing 15 liters. If they've got a raised CRP lymphopenia, so the biochemistry matches that picture, or if their chest X-ray shows you those bilateral peripheral consolidation pictures that you saw earlier, again, all these factors make me think these are high-risk patients having COVID. As Joe mentioned, the ones that are most vulnerable are the ones that are immunocompromised. So we have seen a few patients on the ward that haven't come in with any kind of symptom, uh, maybe apart from a mild fever, no cough, no breathlessness, chest X-ray is normal, but because they've been on immunotherapy or chemotherapy uh, or uh, long-term steroids, they actually have come back positive. We've had actually quite a few cases in the ward like that. So that's why we, we've included immunocompromised as part of that risk score. And of course, if patients 
have uh, for now have actually been self-isolating they might now be coming starting to come in because they've been doing that for two weeks still not feeling well they'll come in they might tell you that they've been living with their whole family who are all unwell assume that they might all have covid and and if they know that they've been in touch with someone that's actually been tested positive again they're high risk and then lastly if they've had a swab result whilst in hospital or they've had one uh discharge and it's come back later um essentially we label them as black they're positive so if they have come in as amber and then this positive result comes back later they they change their rag score changes from amber to black and then you should from then on would say they are a black patient in terms of their positive what's really important to remember um, is that the reason we've developed this risk with this risk stratification score is that it allows us to know um, who we should be worried about um, most of the higher risk red patients um, whilst they might be able to self-isolate at home and, and actually be okay after a few weeks, we have had a few come back in and we've had a few that have come in and deteriorated extremely quickly. So if you think that they are a high-risk red patient but their swab comes back negative, don't immediately assume that that swab result is, is correct. This could be a false negative result. If you really think, given the chest X-ray, their symptoms that they, should, they, they do have COVID despite the swab result being negative, Discuss with the senior, discuss with the registrars or the consultants, because we may need, we, we may need to re-swab them before they're stepped down from their side room and then put in an open bay with other patients who are um, who then are at risk of, of having COVID. So it's a really important thing to know. If you've got a higher risk patient, think is red with a negative swab, reconsider. Do they have a do, are they really you know negative? Or if you really think they they could have COVID, re-swab them again. I was mentioning to you while we were while going through that score of who to swab. So if you've got admitting a, we'll just go over it very quickly. If you've got a patient who is green, it doesn't fit the case definition, but you need it admitted for some other for some reason, don't swab them. Your ambers and your reds, if you're admitting an amber patient or a red patient, they need swabbing. Um, uh, and again, last, last thing is just to, to bring it around again. If you've got a red patient you are not sure about, discuss with your senior, we may need to re-swab them. And just to clarify again, patients who are not being admitted to, to the hospital, they're being discharged from A&E, they do not need to be swabbed. They may have coronavirus and they can go home and self-isolate um, and they should still be referred to the virtual clinic, which we'll come on to. Another interesting thing that's come out of a lot of the data from our virtual clinic so far is that I don't think any of the Ember patients have been readmitted mm -hmm. so far that no. we've um, followed up and in fact most of the most of the amber patients have actually if they've been admitted and then discharged they've come back negative actually but whereas some of the red cohort have come back in yeah, for further yeah, assessment yeah. so there's something in this risk stratification that suggests we're actually doing it really well that we are picking up um correctly um the the level of risk anything else that you no i think that's it yes. um Okay, so on a practical level, um, we discussed who do we swab, but how do we do it? So on ICE, if you search for C19, um, I don't think it necessarily comes up for some reason if you search for Corona or you search for COVID. If you search for C19, it's the only option that pops up. Um, click on it and a box opens and there's a little box within that that you click on and says more info. Click on that um, and it brings up a PDF of this Public Health England form which looks like this. If for some reason this doesn't work, you just go on the PHE website and um, this is readily available. It's a really easy tick box form to complete. It must go off with the swab and the ice form, otherwise the lab won't process it. Um, then complete the ice form in the usual way, um, but do put in relevant clinical information and the risk score so that the lab can prioritize the tests appropriately. Um, the request also automatically um, tests for other common respiratory viruses, namely influenza and RSV, as these are important differentials there. In terms of taking the swab, make sure that you do swab both the nose and also the throat pretty firmly to make sure that you get a fairly good um, specimen. Um, it can be a bit uncomfortable and a bit unpleasant for the patient, but we want to avoid um, getting false negatives just because the swab wasn't adequate. Um, and if you're the one taking the swab, be really careful with infection control. So take the swab, cap it, put it in a bag, and then put it straight into a clean bag that someone's holding for you outside the door so that everything is um, contact free and we're not spreading this from isolation 
um, into the ward. So um, who to admit and who to send home? Um, our main advice here is patients requiring oxygen by definition will need to stay in hospital. So that's anyone with oxygen saturations of less than 94% um, will need to stay in for oxygen therapy. Of course, there are caveats to that. Patients on long-term oxygen at home or COPD cohorts might be slightly different. So do ask if you're unsure. The other group of patients who may be oxygenating okay, but have a septic picture will also need to be admitted. So they are patients who are hypotensive and have some sort of end organ abnormality, such as new confusion, delirium, um, or AKI, for example. This is a little bit different to the usual septic picture because patients with the fever, with the virus are likely to have a fever and may be a little bit tachycardic. Um, but not all of these patients will necessarily need to come into hospital. Um, now, there's a tricky group who need discussion with the medical team um, at a senior level so that we can decide um, whether, they need, whether they need admission or not. Those are patients who fall within the red category, so we think they almost certainly have COVID-19, um, and they are a high risk for deterioration. Um, possibly because they're immunosuppressed or they have multiple other medical problems. Um, and we need to use some clinical judgment and assess these patients case by case, whether they would benefit from coming in for 24 hours for a period of observation, um, or whether they can safely be discharged and followed up with the virtual clinic. So, how are we managing these patients when they come in? Well, really, we're not actually doing anything far too different from patients who are coming in with a, with a community-acquired pneumonia. So we're giving them oxygen if we need it, we're giving them antibiotics, um, and essentially we're giving them antibiotics not because obviously we, we're treating COVID, but to cover for any superadded bacterial pneumonia that may, might be there as well. As Jay mentioned earlier, people with CRPs of, of higher than 100 might, might indicate that. And certainly while they might have a viral illness, uh, makes them more susceptible to a bacterial infection. So that's why we are giving antibiotics, particularly those we are admitting to hospital. So at the moment, our first line is colmoxiclav and doxycycline. Um, for those who have got a penicillin allergy, we're using doxycycline, but if they can't tolerate doxycycline for whatever reason, then we, we can also use clarithromycin. Um, it's important to note that we are using colmoxiclav, but if you've got a patient that's come in with, this, with a history of multiple uses of, of antibiotics and particularly sort of ciprofloxacin, carmoxiclav, or uh, running up to their admission, then do be aware because obviously the, the risk of C. diff is still very much present and we don't want to give that on top of that, uh, on top of what they come in with. Um, so just be very cautious. And of course, the way you always um, assess a deteriorating patient within the ward, if they've come in and after 24 hours on these antibiotics for, for you know, 48 hours, they're, they're not tolerating it and they're, they're getting much worse. Discuss with micro early, see if they need to be escalated to something such as tazacin and meropenem. Don't forget your, your, how you normally assess a deteriorating patient in these situations. Steroids is an interesting thing that, that keeps cropping up. We have evidence to suggest that steroids actually worsens the outcome for patients with COVID. It's to do with the mechanism of delaying the shedding of the virus. Um, there was this sort of rule as to, well, if they've got asthma and COPD, then give them for those patients, um, uh, but don't give them to anyone else. I would be, again, very cautious about who you give them to. If they're really severe asthma, the ones that are maybe even termed brittle and have got a, a, a history of propensity to deteriorate quickly, or really severe COPDs, and then it's safe to give steroids in, in that in that early judgment if you feel they need them. But if they've got someone with, with mild asthma who doesn't really come to hospital, doesn't really use their inhalers as often, then just think twice, maybe discuss it with the respiratory team or the consultants as to whether we should be giving steroids if you are convinced this could be COVID. And the last thing to mention is about IV fluid and, and hydration. So we know that when patients deteriorate relatively quickly uh, and to have a, a uh, full-blown sort of ARDS picture, we know that aggressive fluid treatment can actually worsen that outcome as well and worsen prognosis. So whilst, yes, they do have a viral infection and they're going to be a bit dry and dehydrated, we should be giving fluid to treat that. Just don't be so aggressive. We don't want pile, you know, liters piling in in the first few hours that they're, they're admitted. Just be very cautious. And again, remember nutrition. Some of these patients are, are 
absolutely washed out and exhausted from this virus and they they've been at home for two weeks self-isolating barely managing to eat and drink themselves so that's still still part and parcel of our, of our management make sure they you encourage them to eat when you're going into the ward uh, into into their to their way and and try and help them because it's that's the only things that are really going to give them the strength and energy to, to be able to get discharged quickly and just on the note of the steroids i was asked yesterday by a colleague what we do for patients on long-term steroids who are admitted because they're unwell possibly with coronavirus um do you make sure that you're doubling their normal prednisolone dose in the same way that you would for anyone on long-term steroids coming into hospital who's unwell uh to reduce the risk of a uh, an adrenal adenosine crisis um definitely do not stop them um and again speak to medics or an, an endocrinologist about that if you're unsure So good medical practice suggests that we should be making resuscitation and escalation decisions for all patients routinely coming into hospital anyway. But now this is essential. We must be doing this for every patient. This is largely a registrar, this is a registrar and consultant um, decision. It's our signatures on the forms. Um, but I'd encourage all of you to be talking um, routinely as part of your clerk and part of your assessment um, whether you're in a and &E or whether you're in the medical clerking team, um, have these conversations with, with patients um, and with family when they come in. They can be difficult conversations and it can sometimes seem a little bit out of context. The way I would phrase it is, for someone sus suspected of having coronavirus, is that we know, and I'm sure the patient knows from the news, that they can become very sick very quickly and we can't predict yet who those patients will necessarily be. So we need to know the plan B in advance of what they want and what we think we should be doing for them um, and have that documented. Um, it helps us out if you are having those conversations because it's very difficult and time consuming to have that conversation um, with every patient and, and every family, but they're really important to do. So what happens if they do get worse? So the two main concerns with COVID-19, firstly is type one hypoxic respiratory failure and secondly sepsis, um, particularly with the documented cytokine um, storm or surge um, that can progress uh, later on in, in the disease. And this can happen rapidly. We've seen patients go from requiring virtually no oxygen to needing 15 litres via a non-rebreathed mask in the matter of hours. Um, and again, the x-rays that TJ showed you earlier on correlate with that. So what do you do for the patients who are on 50 meters already? At that point, they, if they are for escalation, they would certainly be need, needed to be discussed with ITU at that point. But we've got a couple of bridging um, mechanisms which we are hoping to um, discuss in more detail in, in further episodes. But the two things are CPAP and Octaflow. So for CPAP, we're starting this at a slightly higher um, PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure, than we normally would. So that's at 10 centimetres of water and an FiO2 of 60% as per the BTS guidelines. Um, or we can be using high flow nasal oxygen or Octaflow. And both of these are for the hypoxic failure. They give added PEEP and they give high, high flow, high concentration of oxygen. Um, these are both available on AMU Green um, in a designated area with uh, a trained respiratory nurse um, and the machines are located there. In practical terms, if you need someone um, started on, on these, those are the people to, to speak to on the ward um, and usual escalation um, to seniors as well. Um, a minority of patients um, may require BiPAP or non-invasive non -invasive ventilation. Um, that's for patients who have hypercapnic ventilatory failure. Um, and again, this is available on uh, what was AMU Green or AMU 2 now. Um, and if I'm sure, discuss with um, the respiratory or COVID teams. The final step, either at the point here where they are on 15 litres, or if they've been tried on one of these and still deteriorating, um, would be for intubation and mechanical ventilation in ITU. But of course, if as dictated by the TEP form and early decisions, at any point, um, a more palliative approach um, may be appropriate. 
So just a quick word on cohorting patients, and this follows on from TJ's earlier discussion about the risk stratification. The, the two principles here with cohorting are one, is that we must do our best to limit spread of disease between our patients within the hospital. The last thing we want to do is bring in someone who doesn't have coronavirus and give it to them. Um, and the second principle, or the assumption here that um, seems to be backed up with the science, is that once you've had um, COVID-19, you are unlikely to contract it again. So what that means in practice is that at Lister, our Strathmore block has been uh, designated as the clean block. So that's for green cases only with no suspicion of COVID-19. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, our positive black patients can and should be cohorted together. So once they've been confirmed on a swab, um, they can be taken out of isolation to free that room up for someone else and put into a bay together. The picture is a little bit more tricky with amber and red patients, um, and this is still uh, a slightly evolving situation as more wards open. Um, it's more tricky because we don't know which of those patients yet are positive or negative. We know that the red ones are more likely to be um, positive, so cohorting them together and not with amber patients um, makes more sense, but again, there's a degree of risk with that and vice versa with the amber patients. So hopefully over the last week, you, some of you have um, heard of the COVID clinic that the respiratory team and the ACT um, have been leading on. So we've now been running this, as I say, for just over a week, and we are uh, able to, we are managing to follow up these patients through a virtual clinic by, by phoning them and assessing them on the phone uh, as to basically how they're doing. And it's actually been running really well. So essentially, this is for all patients that have been admitted who are either amber, red, or had a swab result that came back negative or positive, um, who have been on the ward for even you know, a minimum of 24 hours and then, and, and then they're sent home, uh, please refer these patients to the email address that you can see in this picture. So it's covidc90clinic.enh-tr. So um, just include all these details for us. So the patient's uh, name and NHS number, their phone numbers, also their next of kin phone numbers, just in case it could be, if, for example, if it's quite a, uh, a frail patient who may not uh, have access to the phone easily, then someone who might be with them in the household would be useful to talk to as well. A very brief clinical summary, um, uh, and you know, as Joe mentioned, all the all the relevant findings: their biochemistry, their chest X-ray findings, but most importantly, their RAG score. If they came into hospital admitted as an amber, but then they became positive on their swab, then please mention that they're they're positive. Don't put that they're amber because obviously that's a that's a different thing then. Um, but within our clinic, we have got separate pathways to, to, to prioritise which patients we should be calling first and, and how long we should be following them up for. So just to reiterate, refer all patients with confirmed or suspected COVID to the virtual clinic. This also includes patients in ED. So this actually is a, a really nice way now to allow um, the ED team and the medical team who are seeing these patients to have some reassurance that it, whilst these patients might be at high risk but they're doing okay and not needing anything from us we have some reassurance that they will be followed up by someone we're not just discharging them home and we're leaving them to it um ed also have developed really great safety netting advice um uh, for the patients to follow so make sure that if you yourself um uh, are discharging the patient um please provide them with this advice sheet. Even when they're just being discharged off the ward, give them this advice sheet. It's on the intranet, it's, it's readily available, and point out these certain things that they should be aware of. Again, we do look at things such as breathlessness, and we have had a few patients who, who unfortunately, who have been on hospital for a few days and looked like they were doing well, actually then got readmitted maybe 24, 40 hours later and, and uh, ended up on ITU. So this is, this is the whole reason as to why we're doing this clinic. So please, please do refer. Um, and make sure you include the RAG rating with that. Sorry, TJ, I'm not sure you noticed that on the email address, there's a slightly anomalous C. So that's COVID C19 clinic, just so the emails don't go to the wrong place. So what else can we be doing to stop the spread of uh, coronavirus within the hospital? Um, this is a really bad example of how not to social distance. We're not two metres apart. Um, but we should, we should be. Um, when we all leave work and we're back in the real world and we go to Tesco, um, everyone's um, rightly um, all social distancing. Um, but 
for some reason, when we come to work, we all seem to forget about that. If you look at handover, um, nursing handover, medical handover, there's 20, 30 people often in a very crowded space. Um, and I'd be really keen to make changes to that. So if anyone has any ideas as to um, how we can change the way that we uh, interact at work um, to stop us all becoming ill and being off work, I think that would be a really valuable thing to do. Um, wash your hands a lot. Um, and then there's something that's been developed and promoted by the British Thoracic Society and the Royal College of Physicians called the SPACES principle, which stands for sharing patient assessments cuts exposure for staff. It's a really simple but really effective principle that if you are going into a room, you're donning with all the PPE to go in for whatever reason, you do other things while you're in that room to prevent other members of staff from needing to go in. So for example, as a doctor, if I'm going in to um, ask how the patient is, um, I should also do their next set of observations. If it's time for drugs, I should be taking in their tablets for them. I can take out their food tray um, and simple things like that that mean that I've avoided um, three or four colleagues also needing to go into the room straight after me. Um, it avoids uh, contact exposure and it avoids unnecessary use of PPE. Uh, just a quick note as well on the recovery trial. There's a whole load of um, uh, drug trials internationally. Uh, the recovery trial stands for the randomized evaluation of COVID-19 therapy. It is a UK multi-center randomized control drug trial uh, led by a group in Oxford. Uh, the website's here. Um, we are awaiting the go-ahead um, at list for this to start, hopefully within the next week or so. Um, just a really quick summary, it's uh, a randomized trial with five arms of no treatment, um, antivirals that are normally used in the HIV setting, low-dose dexamethasone, hydroxychloroquine, which seems to um, have had a lot of um, attention in, in the news, and inhaled interferon beta, another antiviral. Um, the reason it's important to flag this up is because as and when we do have patients recruited to the trial um, over the coming weeks, um, don't be surprised if they are on some of these slightly atypical treatments. And just as we draw to the end of the first webinar, I think it's really important that we um, reflect on what support's available for all of us. It's gonna be a challenging few weeks where we are um, tired, we're working on different rotors and slightly different clinical situations to normal um, and with quite emotional uh, challenges at times. So one of the best supports um, I find is to talk to colleagues. I think we all understand what each other are going through probably better than non-medical family and friends at home. Um, and part of this um, is the daily debrief session, which is being led by um, our registrar colleague, Zoe Cantor, uh, which I think is happening daily at 4.30. Yeah, yeah. So I think, I think Zoe will be just sort of establishing this over the weekend and then uh, hopefully should be rolled out over the next week. Actually. Yeah. So I think a really good place to go and um, voice any concerns, yeah. thoughts that you have. And it's not just for doctors, it's for anyone on those wards. It's for healthcare, it's for nursing assistants, it's, it's for anyone involved with these COVID patients. Come along, it's a great way just to, uh, just to basically share what's been going on and, uh, uh, and, and a very, very safe space just to talk as well. And then externally, uh, the BMA, the Royal Colleges have their usual um, support lines um, over the phone um, and via their websites which will be ramped up to help us. Um, most of us are East of England trainees, and again, the deanery has a lot of support in place for us. Uh, locally at Lister, there's the hashtag How Are You Doing campaign, which is led by the leadership and management team. Uh, it's in a little hub just by the lifts on level three, um, and you can drop in there, have a chat, pick up some more information. Um, personally, I find it really helpful at some point during the day to have some time stepping away from your phone. We're all getting absolutely bombarded with WhatsApp messages, with guidelines, with constant rolling news, BBC news alerts, social media. Um, and it's good to stay up to date and things change quickly. But at the same time, I think from a mental health perspective, give yourself a bit of space. Uh, take some exercise, make the most of your uh, allowance of uh, leaving the house once a day for a walk, for a jog. Um, and again, as I'm sure many of you are aware, there's now an on-site pop-up shop um, which has opened over the weekend in the estates and facilities area. There's a big marquee where you can order and pick up these big boxes of um, fresh food, which is really helpful after a long day at work. And 
quite simply, it's not all bad news. We, as Joe was saying, it's, it's going to be a tough few weeks, but have a look at this chest x-ray of one of our patients that we admitted a couple of weeks ago. You can see it's, it's, it's I mean, pretty horrendous from when we, when we first saw this and this patient was not doing well, but lo and behold, this patient was discharged earlier this week and is actually doing really well. She was at a point where we were all thinking that she wouldn't make it and we were considering palliating her and somehow she turned it around. So whilst this is going to be a real struggle and a real challenge for most of us, don't forget that actually we can do this. Most of these patients will recover. Um, and it's honestly, it's a great feeling when we see them walk out that door um, compared, to, compared to what they came in with. So we've come to the end of our first webinar. As Jared said, this was just a, a slightly longer version of it because we just wanted to give you an overview of the things that we feel are important at this time, particularly for our colleagues coming into looking after COVID patients for the first time. But if you do have any questions, please send it to this uh, email address. Um, of anything that you would like us to cover for future episodes, we have already got um, uh, episodes um, plans for, for, as Joe said, palliative care and uh, how to use CPAP and other devices. We've got all these uh, great talks coming up for you, but please, please do send us any of your questions. And if you require any further information in the, for specific, specifically about the clinics or anything that you want, uh, again, do email, we'll, we'll get that information across to you. Of course, we can't leave without um, uh, saying a massive thanks to uh, these uh, particular consultants who have developed lots of guidelines done a huge amount of work in the last few weeks uh, towards uh, helping us understand and, and manage our patients better. So of course, thanks to Dr. Naveen Sharma and Dr. Topping, our radiologists who developed that fantastic um, uh, webinar and, and allowing us to build uh, on, our, on our chest X-ray images. Dr. Locke and Dr. Wilkinson who have been leading the respiratory team side of things. And of course, to, to, to Suresh, our medical director for, for guiding us and um, throughout all of this. Um, anything else you want to add, Joe, before we finish? I think that's probably it. I just wanted to say a quick um, well done and thank you to everyone so far. Um, not only is everyone at the front line putting themselves in harm's way um, for the good of our patients, um, but the way that everyone's doing that with compassion, with flexibility, you're working well outside of your normal comfort zone, your clinical areas. Um, people are taking on extra initiatives um, and doing all sorts of really wonderful things. Um, so thank you, well done, and stay safe and tune in for the next episode. <laughs>